Welcome to the Experience Focused Leaders Podcast. I am delighted to introduce you to Aaron Au, one of the unsung heroes of software as a service revolution, also known as SaaS revolution. Uh, Aaron was a co-founder of Success Factors with Lars Dahlgaard back in 2001. Aaron built Success Factors into the global leader in cloud-based HR software, brought the company public in 2007, uh, and in 2011, sold it to SAP for $3.4 billion, which at the time was the highest multiple for SaaS uh, companies. Uh, at SAP, he continued to thrive and was the president of SAP Jam Collaboration Division, which would, had over 50 million subscribers. Aaron, welcome to um, our podcast. My pleasure. Very nice to talk to you. So uh, one of the things that I didn't mention in the introduction is that Aaron had a very uh, important role in uh, multiple roles in uh, starting Relate to and end this podcast. Um, <laughs> Aaron was one of our first anchor investors at uh, at Relate to. And one of the reasons I think he did that is he saw and trained me up and, and saw what we were building at uh, uh, back when I was an employee at Success Factor straight out of uh, Stanford. So Aaron, thank you very much for supporting the vision before it had any reality into it. Uh, thank you very much for showing us and me personally how to build an inspiring organization like Success Factors. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the founding story and the genesis of the idea and where the cloud as we know it was back then and why it was particularly hard maybe uh, to introduce a new way to do software uh, back sure. in 2001. Yeah, sure. So we can share a little bit. So it sounds like there's like Asian history, right? So, <laughs> which is it is. And um, I, I think at that time, um, my, my, a little bit my, my background, I'm a more computer science background. Um, when I graduate, it's kind of like the heyday to most of the, the graduates trying to do the, the first wave of internet startup at that time. And, but of course, subsequently about 2000s, that is the dot-com burst. Uh, my interest area has always been um, not only in the technology, in the SaaS cloud computing area, because that's actually related to some of the research that I did in the past. Uh, but more importantly, I'm trying to see how we can apply to enterprise. I mean, I'm the kind of person that really trying to apply technology to solving problem, uh, not just for technology's sake. So because of that, I mean, it took me a couple of years to really trying to learn how to create enterprise software. Because at that time, we would talk about pre-2000 that um, the, the, the giants in the industry, it's just like the um, SAP of the world, oracles and people solve and things like that. And most of them is not cloud model for most of the, the audience that may or may not understand the history. So cloud is not really a mainstream. So, so we are kind of like fighting an uphill battle to a certain degree. So I have my first day of startup is a complete failure. And I learned the lesson in this, I, I don't know if it's a hard way or easy way, but it's in, in such a way that it's kind of eye-opening for me because why I say that, because uh, what I learned from there is at the tail end of the company that the company is already kind of like not doing well. So I'm I'm running all the R&D and, and, but then of course my responsibility is not so much on like the go-to-market and things like that. And I'm frankly very new to the industry as well. So, but I trying to ask the sales team, well, how do we actually prospecting? How do we sell to the customers? Um, they show me, they actually very gra gracefully show me. So that's what they did. And this is how the data sheet look like. And this is how they pitching to the customers. Then I realized there's a, such a big disconnect. Why? Because that's a picture of the product within the data sheet. And that picture they took in about nine months ago. I'm on the hour in this, I driving a release process every two weeks. So every two weeks sounds like this corporate industry norm right now. But at that time, don't forget the industry standard, the like standard release from SAP, Oracle, people. It was like two years. Two years. What's it, exactly. Two years. It's two years. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> two years. Uh, of course, nine months from our team point of view is already fantastic because we actually double the industry standard, more than double the industry standard. But still, 
I'm driving a wheelies every two weeks. So think about that, how big a disconnect is. And, and in, my, in the back of my mind, I said, we have no way to be successful. I think my biggest lesson learned there is like, we have no clue how to build a kind of like a, a SaaS or cloud company. So as a cloud company is not just another software company. Frankly, the fundamental DNA and everything need to be different. So I also stumbled because of that lesson learned, um, stumble opportunity to meet Lars, my end up my co-founder for Success Factors. Uh, he high, actually hired by the board at that time for Success Factor to shut down the company. So the uh, Success Factor is not um, a high fly startup. It was not a success work. at the time. No, not the... at all. Founding, it was no. like a what a it, it actually software. burned for a lot. Of the, yeah, yeah, it's, it burned for a lot. Of the well, for a couple of reasons, I think. One, they at the initial idea is still in the on premise model, so they're selling on premise software, number one. Uh, but that's probably not the reason for failure. And what they haven't really realized, I think, to doing uh, not only cloud software in general, but specific for uh, HR, you deploy to everybody's desktop. So one of the things that experience factors come into play very much so because I still remember the early days of success factor customer. A lot of their user using our software, they don't they don't even know how to turn on a computer. They may not even have a computer. <laughs> so it's not right. like today. They don't have smartphone. They don't have any kind of computer device. They are typically like sometimes it's a field worker in warehouse manufacturing, but they don't utilize computer in a normal work. So, but they need to utilize success factor to finish their HR processes, performance reviews, and all the mm -hmm. things that it seems like a norm today. And now today is much easier. I mean, most of the people have a smartphone, but we're talking about 20 some, almost right. 30 years ago. This is actually not, so the experience factor come into a big time on how this will impact the enterprise and the adoption of the software and how you're going to get value of it. I think that's one of the, probably the, the, the failure factors for the, the previous success factor. And secondly, I don't think they have focused on how the initiative, which is like a child is not just about a child, it's about the people to the business. That's, I think, is one of the things that we also kind of like evangelize and how do we going to get the business value out of the people business, not the traditional HR software, because when we actually trying to restart that business, we trying to pitch every single VC we can find. <laughs> but mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, none of them want to invest in us. And mm -hmm. most of them sometimes even laugh at us for two reasons. One, do in the cloud at that time, which is not mature. And after the dot-com burst, nobody want to invest in the, in the cloud business model, number one. And number two, they don't believe that HL is the future of the software so, and how I mean, it's not funny how that can come around that today, probably in the Silicon Valley or even globally, majority of the deal is about related to cloud and future work or people. Future so, work is the buzzword. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. there you go. So, the VCs are not necessarily always on top of it, huh? <laughs> yeah, so it's it coming full circle, I think, I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah. But anyway, so that's kind of like the, one of the biggest lessons learned and how we probably, um, I think at that time, what... We still believe that this is the future. This is something that's very critical, not just for us, as I think it's for the industry. So I, we, we see that people as a factor, they really impact the strategic growth of the business that you really need to have a strategic alignment there. So that's one of the reasons that we put uh, we put full steam forward and continue the, and the start a company in a very tough time. Well, so I think the easiest way for those of you that are not as familiar with the success factors is to think of, uh, that what Salesforce did was a cloud yep. model for sales yep. and you yep. know, CRM. You did yep. it for HR, but more importantly yep. for elevating HR, sure. right? Into what you're saying are people performance, you know, organizational sure. performance, and really saying that you know we are, you know, our success as a company depends on the talent that we bring in, the talent yep. that we you know, cultivate the talent that we retain and how that talent delivers on the key strategic initiatives of the business. And you build the product suite around yep. that, which is at the time didn't really exist, if, you know. And no, it doesn't. Sort of really interesting. Yeah, that's um, scattered around different kind of initiative from learning, development, but they are all like individual. Lab. So I think you're, you're, you're right. So that's one of the things that strategically we're trying to create across the market. First of all, how can we get CHO as a role into the board meeting, basically? Right. As part of the regular 
that to make it because it's people is such a critical component for any business. And that's, I think, is the probably credit to Lars. And that's one of his lessons learned when he was in Unilever at that time. So he realized that in every board meeting, then the CHL or the head of HR is not even in a meeting when they talk about business strategy, but it's such a big piece is missing. So that's actually one of the things that from day one that we have been very, very kind of like focused on that. How can we get CHL as a role into the board and then make sure that they are the one? And not only that, because people business is not just about the traditional core child payroll benefit. It's about a bunch of other things that how do we tie to the full cycle of the employee experience. So ranging from how do we attract them, how to develop them, how to do a performance review, set up goals and all those kind of things. So a lot of those kind of processes exist, but doesn't really have a software uh, to kind of connect them together. I think they have individual point solution at that time in the market. So we are the first one that really kind of holistically kind of like create the, the kind of like the big picture, how those things that related to each other. So I think that's one of the things that what we did as well. So, so I, I think what you've done then is you've basically created, a, you know, multiple categories because the categories yep. change over time. Sure. Uh, and sure. then you help create a category of, you know, software as a service and at the time or cloud. And at the yep. time it, it wasn't even called that, right? It was, it got... It was sort of on demand <laughs> and there, there's multiple brands. Well, ASP and ASP, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Multiple evolutions of that. Um, and I'm really intrigued uh, that the, the, the you and, you know, we talked about Lars Dahlgaard, who's the CEO, uh, your two are kind of insiders, outsiders. And, you know, I could kind of relate to some of that. You, you're Berkeley educated computer scientist, but you're born and raised in Hong Kong, uh, yeah. You know, uh, Lars uh, is a Stanford, uh, you know, Stanford uh, Graduate School of Business degree, but yes, he yes. came from Denmark and, yep. uh, and definitely kind of stands at, at a different height and in general kind of uh, <laughs> mode of engagement than a typical, I would say, sure. uh, you know, American, you know, educated executive. Um, and so... You know, tell us a little bit of how you made the magic work, right? Like, how does the fact that you're both outsiders, but you know, had some, you know, insiders, you know, balance each other out, I guess, or make it, uh, make make the magic of uh, success factors work. Yeah, so I think I guess the I think that's actually one of the things that we we all talk about, at least in the HR industry, we talk about diversity, and I think like what you described. I mean, me and Lars is so fundamentally like difference <laughs> both from like the where we brought up to education to culturally so everything in between right so that's one of the things that I think probably that's one of the reason frankly if I want to kind of like articulate that is like because of that diverse background but I think that we have some core value that we see very uh, eye to eye, like the, how to have the respect of each other's and fundamentally, even though we have different backgrounds, it's not about our past. It's we are trying to create creativity that doesn't exist. So in, in that sense, by definition, nobody knows the answer. So we all need to figure out what the answer is and learn on the fly, basically. So I think for that, it's not so much about, oh, I know the answer, just follow me kind of thing. So it's like we from sales, marketing, product, engineering, everything in between that we need to kind of like learning on the fly. So by doing that, we always have the respect of each other. They're saying, how can we respect each other's domain, but at the same time, how can we also kind of like learning from each other, challenge each other. So you've probably seen some of the meetings that last come into charge of product teams and, and some of the things on the UX and experience. And I would do the same when we do the go-to-market and how do we going to pitch? How do we going to brought customer on boards and things like that? Not that, don't, not that much as like I'm more experienced than some of the sales leader or the customer leader that we brought on, on board. It's most about, I think that's kind of like the, the fundamental DNA that for those have experienced the success factor culture. Uh, to me, that's one of the reasons that how we can really kind of grow as a company and a, and a team, not just me and Lars, frankly. We, we, are, we are a small part of it. When we grow to a certain scale, then we are just like one or two individuals. But I think more as a company, we have that kind of learning agility. I think that's yeah. actually very important. Yeah, agility is a great word. And I kind of 
uh, still was, a, I, I still remember when I just joined and I you know, was sort of green and full of myself and had some ideas <laughs> of like well, how we could do things better, like half baked Stanford sure. MBA stuff. And I approached you and what was, what I remember is that you actually were very welcoming and very responsive, quickly responding to the, to sure. the ideas. And I, I've noticed that sort of sort of permeated through the culture. So I think one of the sort of action words, I guess, was agility uh, that I think you did, you do share that. And I really admire kind of the energy that that's created, but another one, um, you know, broadly, you, there was something about the culture and the experience of being at success factors at the time that I think a lot of alums that, you know, I've interacted with that still cherish uh, the That's environment right. that, that you've created. And so one of the things that, you know, I think about in, in running my own um, uh, effort in, you know, being a small part of that bigger, bigger effort is how do we create both, you know, a mission around which, you know, people can get excited about, uh, which is, you know, very fortunately easy for us, but also the type of organization and dynamism and energy and so, so that people do their best work and kind of cherish the time where they were challenged and given this opportunity. Any tips that you have in terms of how you've over quite a few years created that culture and the type of experience for the team uh, that has managed to last beyond, you know, being absorbed into SAP and remaining in the SAP as a big division, but still people having this memories of, of working together under your leadership. Yeah. So I think if I uh, think back about, I think a couple of things that we did is a, a different uh, to me, it's always been different trajectory of the growth uh, when the company experience. And and frankly, you do need different kind of people and talent. Uh, not that the kind of people that you hire is, is bad talent. It's just like they're at a certain stage that they right. are very focused on what they're doing, but up to a certain scale that they need some different kind of style, different kind of... So I think those are the things that, and of course, I mean, very naturally, like everybody joining, whether it's startup or or, or, or or public company, doesn't really matter. They have their own personal growth agenda. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Certain people looking for titles, certain people looking for certain kind of experience, certain people looking for... So I think it's just how can you fit into some of those into the... Wow, the company is growing more than 100% per year. So I think that's the not easy part. I'll, I'll put it this way. And and the reason for that is like not only you need to spot the tank and stretch them out, but at the same time, wow, you, you the company is growing in more than 100%. So how do you get a balance? Because if you, I, I want to give the team some time, but sometimes I don't have time at all. So, so, so that's kind of like the balancing act to say, how can we still balance the growth of the company? You, 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 you can't just like have the, the individual agenda, but forget about the company agenda, which is like, we're still trying to drive in growth at the best we can, right? So that's kind of like, is everybody is kind of like the, the, the mission um, for the company. While we still want to create some room for individual, because that's actually one of the reasons for the one that have experienced that. I think the most rewarding part, mm -hmm. forget about the, the financial and everything else. I think the most rewarding part for most of the, at least that what I heard from some of the people that give me feedback, is like they really have experience and learn how at what stage to perform what kind of job. So wherever that carry them into the next experience or future career, that's really some things can help them. They can like lean on because they really done something then good or bad, because sometimes the initiative could be a failure. Right. <laughs> we, right. We, we all make mistakes. I think that's one of the, the other things that you remember. We always trying to create a culture that people are not afraid of failing. So you can fail and, but as long as you learn something and, and trying to see how you can be better next time. And I think that's what we really kind of encouraging everybody. And, and that's also part of the core of the DNA. Well, I, I certainly can, can vouch for that. I had a very unglamorous <laughs> career as a field sa enterprise sales executive for a short period of time during 2018 or 2008 <laughs> uh, recession. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, it was painful. Um, and I certainly uh, have a lot of empathy for anybody 
uh, who's doing uh, sales not easy in the, in the not down easy. market and the new market. Um, but I think, you know, I think it's sort of indicative of the company and the culture uh, that you built that then you kind of give people learning experiences and then s set them up in a role where they can over time be successful. And I think to some degree, that's the mission of success factors yeah. product, right? And it's really that's right. uh, fundamental on the kind of human component of it. There's also organizational component. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but let's, let's talk about kind of how do you create the types of experiences that help people achieve their, um, their, their full potential through maybe better feedback, right? Like one of the early starting sure. points. And I recall that, you know, at the very foundation, there was this, there's this uh, content library that we built out that helped people write better yep. reviews. And that was sort of the initial hook that the initial pain point uh, for many users that they had to write a lot of reviews. They weren't necessarily, you know, Shakespeare's of the review process and, you know, yep. were struggling to get, you know, useful feedback for people to develop. And then you did something that was, you know, fascinating, which married software with some content. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the coaching advisor and writing assistant is still the most popular probably feature in the uh, in the success factor performance review. I, I think that's also part of the, um, the learning as well. That um I mean software is fantastic, but one of the things that most of the user, as I mentioned in the early part of the podcast. I think a lot of our users, it's not your typical white color, like uh, utilized computer type of uh, user on a, on a day in day out basis. I think that's, I think it taught us a, a different kind of lessons in order to really get the full utilization. So I think one of the other thing, because we, from the get go, we look at the whole success based on utilization, adoption rates, and and all those kind of things is very important. I mean, probably more the norm for the today's like cloud SaaS business. But at that time, it's not. Most of the time, they measure company success based on sales and revenue. Mm -hmm. We actually look at it different because a fundamental model. We need to have recurring revenue in order to be recurring. You need to have the high utilization rate. You really need to be sticky. So we spent quite a lot of effort, both from experience, how to easy to use and things like that, but more importantly, how to make it sticky. And one of the, the, the interesting part of the learning is like for the stickiness that really correlate to a lot of the content. I mean, the data, because nobody, I mean, most of the time, especially performance review, frankly, I think, majority of the people will hate that process. <laughs> yeah. It's one of once a year and not really an enjoyable process for most of the companies and regardless what software they're using. Yeah. So that's can I, can I just throw in an anecdote here? Because I, I think sure. I can tell you, I know exactly the moment when I thought, hey, this is a real pain. There was, and then there was a moment when I decided to join. Uh, the moment when I thought, <laughs> uh, when I, I'll start with the moment that I decided sure. to join. If there was a, I, I'm in the conference room, I'm interviewed by Lars, maybe I think Rob Bernstein, who yep. became to the CEO of uh, uh, Coupa was was my direct manager. So they would kind of go through these conversations and I see there's this uh, value, value statements. And one sure. of them, I think number nine or 10 was, um, you can have an asshole, just don't be one. And so I was like, and I was like, okay, these guys have a sense of humor. They're they're kind of. The, I think there was there was sort of this energy. Yeah. So that was when I knew I wanted to be part of the part of the team for cultural reasons. But uh, I have a distinct memory of my mother, who uh, God bless her, uh, kind of came in from Soviet Ukraine as a refugee, had first very tough jobs, but then managed yep. to get a job in her field as a software developer went on to be, you know, uh, you know, GM in great companies, but I have a memory of me, a high school student, helping her write performance reviews, where she is an amazing, amazing manager, actually, amazing leader, like, you know, people loved working with her, but she could not, you know, <laughs> could not write those reviews if her life depended on it, she agonized over them, and I was like, you know, I basically became, you know, based on the writing assistant. management of 101. 
I was the cheap version of the success factors <laughs> writing assistant and grammar check or whatever it was with slightly better English. I also didn't speak English very well. So I was like, this is, there's value, there's, there's value there. Value for that. There That's is value, value there because the pain, Absolutely. the pain involved felt just really profound. So congratulations on finding that. So that, <laughs> so back to, back to your story. Sorry for that, uh, you know, commercial. No, no, no. I, I, no, that's exactly right. So I think mean, you talk about how to marry contents. I think mean, that's kind of like prolonged, kind of like the lesson learned that. I think mean, the software industry as a whole also evolved from just purely just produce software, right? I mean, when you're trying to drive in utilization, then you need some other things. So of course, today, the, the probably hot topic is like the AI and other things like that. But I mean, to me, the, the, the goal is still remaining the same, right? So how are they going to drive utilization rate up? Um, I think a little bit similar. I mean, if you still remember, I do that knowledge, for, well, maybe 30 years ago. It's almost like the gaming industry. So for most of the green gaming industry, they measure based on screen times and and things like that is from day one. I mean, the, the gaming industry has always probably a little bit more advanced than enterprise software from that standpoint to how they're going to measure the, the true success of the utilizations and adoptions and things like that. Because when nobody opened up your game, even I can sell the game to you, that means the game is game over. So you, that no, would not be a success, right? So that's, I think, one of the things that have always been the case that kind of like having the, the enterprise uh, software sector have learned and, over time. and over so they time, need to be more better yeah experience, they need to be better better, better experience and yeah. whatever that can give you an edge to just not just like deploy or give tool yeah. to employee frankly i will argue today's most of the enterprise employee have more tool than they need it they just don't yeah. know don't how know. to use some of and them they, not, they are more about workflow so i think there's a sort of yeah. workflow and then it has its benefits but I think sure. what I what I loved about that feature, and if I connect the dots, kind of on the evolution, and then yeah. frankly, this gave us insights as well, is like people want to be creators, so you want to write yeah. a good review, right? Like you kind sure. of who, which manager doesn't doesn't want to write a thoughtful, helpful review, right? If you're a decent, yep. manager, you want to do that, but yep. they lack the knowledge or the skills yep. of maybe how to be a creator exactly. in this contact, right? So you're providing exactly. them. This, you're enabling them to be a creator. So they have yeah. a great exam experience as a creator because you are using, you know, either algorithms or AI or whatever you're using to Wherever, create yeah. that. Yeah. And then on the reverse side, there is a recipient of that creation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which has long been ignored, right? Like and like forgotten and like <laughs> but actually they're the lifeblood, right? They they could be. Uh, it's CMO could get a review, like a CEO could get a review, right? And uh, they're so these recipients are they getting um, are they getting good experience? Are they getting yep. you know the like the advice those are human too. So those on the or human the advice level, that kind of makes the you discouraged yep. and disheartened, or is it like very shallow? Oh, you're awesome. You know, you're yep. just a Barbie <laughs> here. You know, be awesome. You know, like keep up the good sure. awesomeness. That doesn't really help people grow and develop either, right? So how do you, yeah. so you've effectively found this balance of creating great experience for creators and great experience for consumers of- I think we're uh, still you, learning yourself. about it. I, th I think it based on the, the, the business goals. And I think that's what you, one of the reasons that um, when, when you have the idea how to start the company that I- kind of jump on it to 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 try to help wherever I can. I think really, I think that's one of the things that is still to a certain degree is not the, the norm in the industry is how can you balance between the kind of like the creator and certain knowledge and kind of like create a great presentation of Microsite is probably one of the good example of that too, right? So yes, there's many, many tools out there. Yeah. Yeah. So historically, I think people focused a lot more on the like like simple creation like powerpoint sure. right first generation yep. anybody yep. can create the problem is people create ugly powerpoints and uh <laughs> you know little sticky figures bubble yep. type of things right uh then the second wave was on really on collaboration we'll come back to that because you sure. you you built a product with a yep. huge number of subscribers uh on that and I think we were the third wave, uh, one of the one of the folks focusing on the third wave, which basically said that in the age of information overload, um, yeah. 
really for the creators and collaborators to be successful, yeah, they need to start at the end. Start with the yeah. recipient, recipient and yeah. people that will be actioning their message into the world and sure. then work backwards, right? And all of the innovation on creation and collaboration, fantastic, right? You sure. know, but if you don't start with the recipient, you kind of are going to be lost in the noise of the digital. That's exactly right. Digital overwhelm and probably lose out to some of the consumer apps that add zero value to humanity. But you know, it's kind of, <laughs> you know, but but actually are really really good at yeah. uh, sucking up people's time and attention towards yeah. things that you know maybe make them self conscious and not you know not focused on things that add value to their lives. But hey, they're good at you know, behavioral optimizations. So this is sort of the, uh, the challenge. So tell us a little bit about the kind of the, that evolution from creation to collaboration that you've led with Jem and yeah. you know, how you rolled out like the, the hidden, but the large, probably the largest at the time, uh, subscriber base of probably. actually collaboration product. Um, so yeah. tell us more. Yeah. So I think that's, I think along the same line and how I think we, we pretty much bore the the same DNA where I inherited um, the SAP Gem unit within SAP is how can we make sure this, I mean, collaboration, not just for collaboration sake, to a certain degree that at least in my, um, in my learning through success sectors, and I think then bore that lesson to the collaboration spaces. I think by nature in the enterprise space, the certain process or task is collaboration by nature and certain thing is not and what i mean by that is like learning is actually a collaboration by nature you actually learn from each other you typically right. don't learn on your own i mean even though there's many e-learning platform many e-learning content but majority of learning is actually on the peer-to-peer -peer learning i learn a lot from you you may learn something from me that's probably the most effective way that i show you how to do certain thing or we collaborate on so this is a collaboration by nature kind of problem the not so much collab like workflow is not a collaboration by nature problem you just right. need somebody fast approval so we I think at the, at that time, unfortunately, as, as a space, and we have many kind of like different company proposed the kind of like the Facebook for the enterprise kind of ideology, but to a certain degree, they mix, they mix with a lot of the noise between like collaboration by nature tasks with sign not so much collaboration by nature tasks all mixing together and trying to just put one platform and just go and ask the employee or end user to say they have fun. So that is not a success, which is why the initial wave of it is that, I mean, in Jam, we actually do something fundamentally different. So, so, so let's, we, let's, let's yeah. pause on that. So you kind of, yeah. so you're mentioning this, let's let's be real. So there's a pretty famous yeah. entrepreneur, uh, CEO of, uh, uh, of a product called Yammer. Uh, yeah. um, he's now a venture capitalist, David Sachs. Sure. Sure. Um, so they, they've done some very interesting things with Yammer yeah. in terms of the go to market, yes, but I, I think he would probably agree that they didn't, that they, they didn't figure out, you know, exactly what, you know, the use, usage in the enterprise that's would be highly valued, uh, would be in, in the product got, while it got bought by, uh, Microsoft for about a billion, you know, it sure. ultimately didn't kind of last and, and now yeah. there, there's other solutions. So tell us a little bit about. Kind of your jam came out in that universe in that era uh, originally, but you built it into something else at SAP, and so maybe like we could do compare and contrast to that, maybe to yeah. Slack. So we we pick a little bit different kind of path. So we we focus on and we follow the the storyline that I lay out. That we only focus on we believe what is the collaboration by nature kind of problem then really kind of go deep into that solution. So for example, learning, and we talk about that. So then yeah. we launching, we are not launching another collaboration platform in Jam. The first thing we launch is called social learning. So we focus on how can you apply collaboration to solving a learning problem and complement the traditional e-learning platform or your online courses. But how do you interject the component of how do you learn from each other, peer learning? How do you curate, curate the content that within your peer, how to follow the, the subject matter expert that has 
in the organization, but no certain topic really well, but nobody know. Nobody else know that Alex is actually a expert in certain areas. So we trying to leverage the platform to really expose the experts, the content, the different area that really drive. And suddenly you see not only our user base in platform increase, but also the utilization also increase at the same time. So that's what we would like to see. We trying to drive more utilization because a collaboration platform similar to everything else. It's like, if you don't have the utilization, probably that platform will die. It doesn't matter what whether it's come from SAP or Microsoft or Google, it doesn't really matter. You need the kind of like the, the, the utilization, you know, to survive within the enterprise environment. So we are actually focused on that kind of say high value, high velocity task. That really kind of also differentiate us for the general platform because then we are not positioned in trying to compete with like the Microsoft the world. We we just we are not. We we are actually we're social learning. We focus on this is actually what we really want to focus on driving you like then. They can launch it, they're much easier to brand it and much easier. And the user actually logically can remember, okay, I use Jam as for my peer-to-peer -peer learning. I want to see how Lars is doing uh, today. I want to see what Alex is doing today. Then I will leverage the Jam as a platform because as you know, and I talked to many, many CIO before they come to get closer, every one of them, the biggest problem is they're, they're not lacking of platform. They actually have too many platforms. <laughs> if they utilize Salesforce, they have the Salesforce platform. They are probably right. a Microsoft user. They have the Microsoft. And also if they're IBM too, on a certain degree, they may have the IBM platform. I mean, there's many, many things for the employee. This is very confusing. Because so you all those collaboration- to find, find the niche for the employee to think yeah. about this goes well with these tools. Exactly. Et cetera, right. Okay. Exactly. So that's kind of like the one of our kind of like lesson learned that then that's why then we focus on how can we do social onboarding? How can we, I mean, of course we latching on, this is one of the things that is still from my root on success factor related to people, maybe more like how do we in the enterprise contact helping employee to getting value out of it. So that's another things that we we utilize, but then the, the high level goal is remain the same. So like, how can we differentiate ourselves in the kind of like the red sea of the different collaboration platform out there how can we make the employee stand out? Can remember, oh, Jam is for me to do this, right? So, so they're not confused. You continued to do category building. It sounds like yep. from the yep. pre-IPO days at Success Factors yep. <laughs> through the IPO, where I remember uh, we, we were crafting the positioning even as the, sure. during the IPO was shifting a little bit from you know performance management to performance. And goal management to to perform in the talent management. Yep. And yep. So, on. Um, so it's really interesting that you brought that up. Generally, how do you um, how do you see this process working of category creation? Because I think one of the challenges is if you don't have you know enough uh, market momentum yeah. yet, right? Like sure. it's sort of pretty sure. tough to create a category. Um, yeah, it is, and the, or redefine it at least. But yet you do need to differentiate and stand out from day one, you know, yeah. almost as an entity. And I, I think a lot of companies are struggling. Frankly, I, I was like debating how do we do this? Because in some cases, when the category exists, like uh, for us, we noticed flip books, these things existed. Yep. Sure. I never wanted sure. to build a flip book solution I'd relate to, but hey, people are looking for flip books. Let's show them. The future of the flip book and you know so we embrace that as one of the categories that already existed but we wanted to transform and yeah. you've done this multiple times successfully so what are, what are the secret what is the secret behind that uh transition well, I, I think that I, i'm not sure that's a secret i think there's a fine line between so maybe i can probably answer a little bit differently so when you look at it in reverse, it's like what's how to define success, right? So how can you make your solution stand out? So first of all, you hope whatever you're doing have some competitors. But when you have competitors, how are you gonna stand out above all the competitor? And how do you make the whole category to certainty, whether it's existing category or brand new category or rebrand a category that to be vibrant that people pay attention to, right? Because it's not just about you. If this particular idea or or solution that you 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 embark a journey to trying to 
make some industry <laughs> transformation to a certain degree, you need to have the core value that align to the buying center budget, everything else. In order to do that, you actually need to understand the problem way better than most of the client or even your competitor have. In order to then, then you can can figure out the formula. Can I differentiate based on purely just based on my execution, maybe my pricing, my distribution, whatever, or I need to have a combination of that, but with a different positioning and solving kind of like a combined different kind of problem. How, how do you going to make the problem statement even bigger, right? So how do you make a child, not just a child problem, but a company strategic problem. So things like that, because those are the things that can only help you and the industry to really kind of like redefine what that is. Then when kind of like timing has come, that's another thing that most of the startup probably cannot control is the timing, right? You might have the fantastic idea, but the timing is not right or just based on whatever the macro economy could be economy downturn, uptake, whatever that might be, that impact whether certain category become a focus area or not through the customers, right? Because the customer may spend money on certain things it really depends on the time and date on the over the, the the years and and today when there's a lot of uncertainty geopolitical then you're probably less about the, the geographic expansion but you still need to have a distributor workers and all those kind of things so you you create a different kind of kind of like a problem for scaling not so much about whatever you're doing the idea is good or bad it can still be a good idea, but maybe five years from now, or you may be a good idea. It's just a little bit too late already. So, so I think all those kind of things that causing, of course, that why startup is still not a slam dunk is typically it's a hit and miss. And the reason a lot of the time is because the timing is not something that the, so you got to get the timing. Control. You got to get the timing right amongst other things. So exactly. On the, on the timing and you brought up economic yeah. uncertainty. So I want to double click on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, as we as we wrap up the the conversation, this phase of the conversation, and then we continue yeah. <laughs> with a, a relay to team. Thank you so much for agreeing to do that, Aaron, to do ask me anything with our team. No but one of the questions that everybody is is uh, wondering, and folks in Europe, which may have some more economic pressure, but folks in the US are worried about that. Yep. Uh, Asia is growing like always, but hey, you know. Um, uh, the parts that grow more and parts that don't grow. So, yep. how do you, um, how do you in the economically uncertain environment, uh, how yep. do you focus on people? Because it's always like the war for talent, blah blah blah. That story is great when you know when you can't hire uh, enough people uh, right fast enough, and we kind of we're in the technology world going through that cycle. But I think there's still some pockets where it's really hard to find um, and attract great people. And then some places, you know, <clears throat> the environment is changing and people are not no longer negotiating over their pet bereavement leave, right? Like they're, sure. they're slightly more realistic expectations about, about yep. kind of what's a workplace for. Uh, and so how do you, um, how do you help organizations navigate, you know, given the market realities through yeah. a, a place where in some roles it's hard to hire people still yeah. and in some it's frankly more competitive more demanding environment than it may have been a few years ago yeah i, I think the the uncertainty economy and environment also create a, a shifting a little bit on the supply and demand curve for from from a, from a people perspective and what i mean by that is probably people will be a little bit more risk averse and then trying to go back to their whatever their the norm. Uh, but that also means, especially for startup, the problem for startup is you typically have some more role and things like that. But by nature, startup is doing something nobody have done, right? So, so you need to create a role or you need to have employee to continue to try. It's not like I can just hire somebody from the, from the street to do something already, unless you're doing some commodity thing. Otherwise, that... You are by nature, you're looking for people trying to fail fast and innovate. And but when you have a economy uncertainty, then people is risk averse and you have less people willing to try right. or give a little bit on that. But that actually create more problem to startup or in general, not just startup. Even well, let's talk about content. even. Yeah, let's because you're one of the unique yeah. 
startup founders that ended <laughs> up leading a major division at SAP. Uh, yep. You know, so and and also made from a technology uh, yep. CTO founder to a general manager president type sure. of role. So tell that to, you know, obviously in the context of HR. So maybe actually double clicking on that. You know, yep. Let's talk about large organizations that do have, yeah. um, you know, distributed workforces, you know, and the sort of stress related maybe to the economic uncertainty. Uh, how do you get them focused on, you know, sailing through these turbulent waters effectively? Yeah, so I think for the big company, even the problem you could argue is bigger. But the reason for that is they they need to kind of like, I mean, for most of them, it's a public company, right? So they are, they have a kind of like the responsibility to driving more profit, margin to a certain degree. And then they aligned it to most of the time related to people is about their location strategy, right? Like in SAP, they have, I, I, I forgot at that time, I don't know today, maybe over 20 different development locations and have a huge development uh, teams uh, involved and things like that. So then when you're trying to say open a headcount, you can be put into many different locations. So it's way more complex and, and trying to, to balance out your costs and how do you going to make sure you're driving margin that way. But that's also become a little bit more problematic because it's, then it's not so such obvious as like, I only hire in a low cost location, for example. Uh, I think in order to really going to create critical mass and drive by nature, I mean, doesn't matter as SAP or startup, you still create innovative world, right? Innovative meaning you create something that doesn't exist in the market. So you need to have the personality, the team that have that drive to try to create some nature and pushing kind of like the, the envelope in terms of how they're going to create more value in some things that the customer have not seen or experienced. So by then, you're not just looking at like a spreadsheet of like what's the low cost location just doing that. So you need to balance it out and create a culture that how you still, doesn't matter you how many location you had, you still couldn't have a, a, a one team kind of culture because we win as a team, you, we lose as a team. It doesn't really matter whether it's jam or success factor. When a customer saying, I'm not renew your solution, is not because just Aaron or Alex, it could be everybody else, right? So that's, I think, is one of the things that we need to balance. I think to answer your question, I think the big organizations sometimes even have more pressure. How are they going to make sure that they can balance that and a small team and sometimes startup, by default, they have their constraint, right? You if you just yeah, start in you, one you location, you have to do it. You have yeah, you 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 can't actually cash just flow, like cash have... flow constraints. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Sometimes choice you have more choices is not so so much a good thing for you. So 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 that's I think is that they to me they are equal challenging in terms of doesn't matter big or small scale. But one of the themes that I, I hear, and I think this is something you brought up at the very beginning, is accountability, right? And yeah. and I think what what success factors software enabled, right, was an accountability in terms of, all right, these are the, your goals at, let's say, the beginning yep. of the year or the beginning of the of the, of the the mid-year. This is what actually happened. These are the KPIs that were achieved. Some of it is out of your control. Some of it is square in your control. Some of it, your own development goals that you've set for yourself or, yep. or was your manager. So um, this is really, you know, profound, right? Because I, I think there are some some things in our nature that makes us be workers, and there's there's also sure. a parallel thing that that we kind of like, you know, default to laziness, and you know, you know, sure. watching uh, unlimited Netflix <laughs> subscriptions and whatnot, <laughs> right? And um, I think the social environment, uh, cre you know, that such as work creates the opportunity for yep. individuals to a support a cause that they hopefully care about but b sure. really do their own best right and and their yep. own best in parallel with colleagues and this is one of the joys of building a company and yep. you know i think you've built a software yep. that that actually helps bring that sense of accountability um to individuals and to teams w what have you seen change for people being more deliberate about how they set goal, how they measure themselves over time. And have you seen kind yeah. of an evolution in the market in that, even like in terms of, 
you know, early days of success factors versus, mm -hmm. you know. Well, like I think the one of the biggest changes is like, I think this is very much so tied to a different generation thing as well, right? So the today's graduate versus like, when we start the company, create the software is for the baby boomer of the world. So the, 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 the thinking and the kind of the, um, the how do they work, the working style, and also what do they, how do they brought up and all those things, fundamentally different. So I think that when you try to drive the accountability culture at the same time, you also need to take in consideration the different generation gap. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the different generation, they got motivated and by very different things, right? My son is 17 years old, so it motivated very differently when I was 17. So, so that's one of the things that I think that um, most of uh, the this, leader... this is a perfect aside. I, I have not personally worked <laughs> with your son, but I think yeah. one of the best gifts that you've done uh, for us is you've uh, introduced your your niece, Ashley, uh, uh, Ashley. <laughs> to during her gap year at Yale. She helped us out um, during kind of the COVID thing. She took a year off and in a supportive yeah. relate to. And uh, we still have uh, legendary stories about our family productivity actually in particular <laughs> and how yeah. she she kind of um pace uh pace set for for the entire team uh as an intern you know un an unpaid intern mind you and it was just kind of tremendous um uh tre tremendous like i think that's why i kind of really want to ask you a question like yeah, if sure, your son sure. just at 17 just completed an internship outside yeah. of the country as well so so kind of Tell like I, I mean a lot of people want to know how do they I want to know how to motivate my kids you know much less uh, I, much I less want younger. to know too so, <laughs> so, so I I think it's less about I, to me of course motivation they they got motivated by different things I I, I right. think the the lesson learned for me is I can't put myself in their shoes to say because I motivate by X Y Z then yeah they must be motivated by something they typically don't. And I, and I think we, we need to learn. And I, what I'm trying to do for the next generation, not just my son, but all the kind of like the intern, I have company that have intern and we, I just talked to that. We try to create an environment that they can explore. I think I think different generation, the common theme is they all want to explore differently, right? So, and, and that's and, beautiful. And I, that's beautiful yeah. thought. So we yeah. want to build a generation of explorers. Yeah, Aaron. absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, lovely to reconnect with you. Thank you for your support. And thank Anytime. you for starting the SaaS world as we know it and helping uh, bring in generation of SaaS startups as well that are no, hopefully just small doing part wonderful of it, things. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.